Our scripture passage this morning comes out of Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They, didn't, they went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while we talked on the road and as he opened the scripture to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem, where they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. Then the two told them what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that the living Lord breathe on us his peace so that our eyes may be open to recognize him and our feet may be willing to follow wherever he leads. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We are in and continue to celebrate the Easter season today and for the next five weeks. And we're going to be hearing all the classic post-resurrection stories spread throughout the Gospels. Typically, they are actually interspersed between the lectionary text, which kind of goes for three years, But for this Easter season, I have actually pulled them all from the lectionary and from scripture and have arranged them kind of in chronological order. So we will follow the story that Jesus uh, has after his resurrection until his ascension. We will be following now that chronological order. I was going to say that today... um, was this is one of my favorite stories in scripture, um, Jesus and the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. But then I was thinking if I said that, I might start sounding like a broken record throughout these next five weeks, six weeks, because so many of these stories are just amazing that we are going to get into these weeks. But it still is one of my favorites. It's a scene that doesn't take too much to visualize. I mean, as I read the passage this morning, couldn't you just see it playing out in your head? It's Easter Sunday still. The women have come back from the tomb, a bit shaken, 
confused, and they tell their story. The tomb is empty. Jesus is not there. His body's not there. Some angelic figures are there telling us that Jesus has been raised from the dead, and they told us to come tell you. The section right before our passage this morning today in Luke tells us exactly what the disciples thought of those women as they heard this story. They thought that that story was just utter nonsense. They didn't believe the women. Though a disciple or two, like Peter, still went to the tomb to confirm that Jesus was not there. For our two disciples today, it was time to get out of Jerusalem. The Passover festival was over, Sabbath was over, and the Jewish religious leaders in Rome had crucified the one that they had hoped would save Israel, the one that they had committed to following. Who knows if the Jewish leaders or Rome were going to now come after Jesus' followers. It was no use sticking around to find out, right? So might as well go back home. So Cleopas and an unknown disciple head home on the road to Emmaus. We don't know who the other companion is. It very likely could have been his wife or just another disciple. What we do know is that even as they are leaving Jerusalem behind, they cannot escape the situation. They get caught up, caught, caught up talking about it on the way. Our translation today in Luke doesn't exactly quite convey the intensity that the Greek words convey in Scripture. It's more that they were in a deep, engrossing, engaging discussion with each other. They were trying to wrestle it out with everything that had gone on in these last few days, trying to make sense of it, of where, where could they have gone wrong? How did it all go wrong? In the middle of this, the stranger joins them and asks what they're discussing, what this is all about. The suspense and the irony of this story is so great. As readers, we know it's Jesus. And now we just watch, read the drama playing out, waiting to see when they figure it out, waiting until they're able to finally see that it's him. The disciples are shocked that this person would not already know what they're discussing. For those in Jerusalem, this event would have been known. Maybe not everyone cared as much as they did, but with all that Jesus had done leading up to Passover, with the triumphal entry, with the cleansing of the temple, the questions by the religious leaders before he was arrested, he would have been talked about in Jerusalem, and his death would have been known, even in just passing gossip. As they explained to Jesus what things had happened in Jerusalem over the last few days, you can hear their despair. Jesus of Nazareth was a prophet a man powerful in word and deed from God and the people. But our religious leaders had him killed. But we had hoped he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. The despair of those words is heartbreaking. We had hoped he was the one. Jesus, who had brought hope to so many, had his disciples anticipating and preparing for the kingdom of God to start soon, preparing for the victory of God and Israel over oppressive regimes. He was dead. And his, in his death, hope had died too. After the death of his wife, C.S. Lewis wrote about trying to avoid all the places that he went with her places that reminded him of her so that he could try and reduce the pain of losing her. But he found instead, and he wrote that, her absence is like the sky, spread over everything. He could not get away from the grief. It was pervasive. And it feels very much the same for our two disciples this morning. We can hear the pain 
and the loss in their words. But Jesus does not leave them in their despair. Though he is frustrated with their lack of understanding and their misunderstandings, he spends the time to teach them again what the scriptures say about the Messiah, teaching them that the Messiah was not going to save Israel from their suffering, but that he was going to save Israel through his suffering. And that through it, God was creating everything new, calling to him a new people who are forgiven, restored, and redeemed. We worship a God that we can read over and over again in the Bible and scripture as a God who deeply loves us, whose compassion and mercy never fail us, who continues to pursue his beloved children because he desires to be in relationship with them. Jesus is our example, God made visible, of seeing how much God loves us. In these Easter stories, these stories after resurrection, we read about a God who continues to pursue, continues to love, continues to teach, continues to regather his disciples to him. Last week, we heard the words of Jesus through that messenger in the tomb, that Jesus was alive and that he had gone ahead of the disciples and was waiting for them and calling them to Galilee. They were words of grace, forgiveness, mercy, and hope. Words calling his disciples back to him. Last Sunday and in the coming weeks, we will continue to read stories of Jesus coming to those when they cannot seem to believe, when it doesn't seem to make sense, when they are anxious, when they are scared. And today we see Jesus come to his disciples when they had lost all hope. For we had hoped he would be the one to redeem Israel. Christ comes to the brokenhearted, the fearful, the anxious, the ones struggling with faith, and to the hopeless. Our story today in its despair is also a story of hope and good news. It's a story that proclaims that God still loves us and still pursues us. Christ still comes to the brokenhearted, the fearful and anxious. He comes to those struggling with faith or whatever we might be struggling with. And he comes to those who have lost hope. Christ comes just like this story today and meets us on the road and joins us for the journey. Christ comes and walks with us so that we do not have to walk alone. Christ did not wait for them to find him. Who knows how long that would have taken if Christ would have waited for the disciples to find him. Instead, Christ goes to them. And Christ did not even make them go all the way to Emmaus. Instead, he shows up in the midst of it all, on the road, to offer understanding, to offer peace, to offer restored hope and joy that can only be found in him and through him. And he stays for the journey. We do not have to wait to reach Emmaus. We don't have to wait till we turn 16 and get our driver's license. We don't have to wait till we finish college. We don't have to wait till we find the perfect relationship. We don't have to wait till we find the perfect job, the perfect retirement plan, the perfect anything. None of those are what we need. We don't have to wait till we fix all our issues or our family's issues or ourselves. What we need is Christ who is standing right before us on whatever road we are traveling right now. And he's offering us life, life transformed by God's love and overflowing with God's mercy. 
I wanted to provide some time for us today as we are thinking of this story and, and say thank you to God for pursuing us, for coming and being with us on that road, being willing to walk with us in our joy, in our sorrow, in our pain. Worship is about coming to God, coming before God and giving all of ourselves to God and giving thanks and praise for who God is and what he has done for us. It's participatory in nature, and especially when we are in moments that for safety reasons kind of limit our participation, it's important to find creative ways to engage with God and engage with each other. And so with that, you were all given footprints this morning. And, and I have extras up here if you need them, so I, I can hand out more, or if you need more than one, I have some extras up here. And on it, on these footprints, I want you to write just a simple sentence or two, or a word, or a prayer, or draw a picture, anything you want, to either thank God for a particular situation that God has met you in, or to say thank you to Jesus for loving us and dying for us. Knowing, however, that the hope and joy in Christ as Christians that we have is not naive hope, it's not shallow joy, I do not want to dismiss the suffering, the heartbrokenness, and the hopelessness that can still happen in our lives. The resurrection doesn't erase heartbreak. Have, having joy and hope as Christians does not remove the pain in this world, not completely. And most likely, each one of us could have uttered this phrase at some point in our life, we had hoped. We had hoped for a different diagnosis. We had hoped that they would have gotten better. We had hoped whatever you had hoped. If you are not in a place of thanksgiving today, or if you are, but your heart is still aching in sorrow or in pain from situations of this life, I would encourage you to write down, a, write down a situation where you are in need of remembering that God is with you, that God still comes to the hurting, the broken, the hopeless, and offers his tender mercy and love, that God does not make you walk alone on the road but comes in the midst of it all to offer everlasting life to you. I've always been struck by the Apostle Paul when he writes in the beginning of his letters that the value of sharing our Christian walk with each other, the stories of our faith, that when we share, we mutually encourage each other. And so I ask you just to write, create a footprint. No need to put your name on them or anything like that. They can be anonymous. But after you're done, I'll just have you set them in your pew or you can put them in the offering plate as you exit this, mor this morning. But as we create, I'll gather them this week and I'll post them on the billboard that is just closest to the sanctuary. And so next week when you come to church, we can read each other's footprints. We can read each other's thanks and praise to God for when he has come in the mist and joined us, and we can read each other's prayers and join in them and pray that we feel the presence of God in the midst of the journey that we're in right now. And if, for those that are watching this online this week or hearing this message um, uh, online, I would encourage you also that if you can make a footprint and send it into this church this week, I would love that so that all our footprints can be together as um, signs of God's love and presence with us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who not only calls to us and invites us to draw near to you, but you, Lord, come and seek us and draw near to us when we are in need when we have lost hope, when all seems too much. Not only do you go before us and show us the way, 
but you also come and meet us in the journey. We thank you for each one of these footprints, Lord, remembrances of your past faithfulness, praises for your goodness, or witnesses to our need for you, and that you are the only one who is worthy of our prayers. Thank you, God, for your love and compassion, your sustaining presence and grace, and your unfailing faithfulness. You are a God who loves each and every life. Help us to do the same. Receive now the offerings of our lives, our time, and our labor, and feed us with your grace. We pray this along with the prayer you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>